Hello everyone and welcome to the forest. This is Matt from Indefensive Plants and today I'm taking you on the hunt. The hunt. Not for any sort of animal of course, but rather a tiny little plant in the carrot family aptly named the Harbinger of Spring. I don't know if we're gonna find it, it's a bit of an oddball, but join us, we're gonna see a lot of cool stuff along the way. Let's go. Here is a tree we don't want to mess with. This is the honey locust, Gladitsia triacanthos. It's a member of the pea family, but as you can see, it is really, really well defended with spines. Now, this may seem a bit excessive if you're looking to defend yourself against something like a squirrel, or even something as big as a deer, or even something as big as a deer. I don't think that's what this tree has in mind. So there's this theory called the megafaunal dispersal syndrome. The species that we see in the woods today have been around for millions of years, and they evolved alongside things like woolly mammoths, mastodons, gonfotheres, very, very giant megafauna that have since gone extinct. But the 10,000 years or so that those animals have gone extinct isn't enough time for plants to evolve away some of the mechanisms that they evolved during that time period, and this is one of them. So this tree is super well defended from about convenient budding height up to about 13 feet or so, maybe 20 or more. And those spines are huge as you can see, a little excessive if you're trying to defend yourself against squirrels or even deer. But if you're thinking of something like a giant ground sloth or a mastodon, this is a pretty good defense mechanism. But that's not the only line of evidence we have in support of that idea. If you look over here, the seed pods on this plant are huge. I mean, absolutely massive. If you're trying to attract a squirrel or even a deer, you really don't have to put that much energy into uh, a seed pod of this size. What's more is the inside of the seed pods are full of this nice sugary gelatinous material that probably would have tasted really good uh, to a large mammoth or something like that. And I think these are what we call anachronistic features. Features that don't really have an explanation in our modern times, but make a lot of sense in the context of uh, things like the Pleistocene megafauna. So this tree is a really cool window back into a time period long forgotten. Check it out. I told you we'd find some cool stuff. This right here is Botrychium dissectum. It's an awesome species of fern and an ancient one at that. This lineage arose long before what we know of as ferns really branched off from the rest of the group. Now this one is what we call an evergreen fern. It made this leaf last year and it persisted throughout the winter. And when it's exposed like this, they produce a lot of pigments to protect their tissues called anthocyanins. But the added benefit is it gives them this wonderful bronze hue. It's really attractive. Now it may not look like much, but this fern has an absolutely fascinating natural history to it. They require mycorrhizal fungi, social, specialized symbiotic fungi that live in their roots. And they depend on them so much that they absolutely can't germinate and grow without them. In fact, sometimes these ferns will take a rest for as much as a decade and disappear underground, feeding solely off the fungi until they have the energy reserves needed to produce a leaf and eventually a separate stock that'll produce the spores. This is a great find and a great indication that we're in some rich forests. So let's head on and see what else we can see. I'm super excited to have found this plant. This is Spring Beauty, Claytonia virginica. It's a hardy little plant and really kind of early to be flowering right now. It's still coming up in a lot of places. Pretty soon in a couple of weeks, this whole area will be carpeted, but it's been warm enough and the rains kind of woke this one up. So now it's flowering. I think last time I checked it's related to the portulacas, but in terms of spring ephemerals, this is one of the earliest you're going to see. It's a great species for early pollinators, especially the small solitary bees that everyone really likes. One of the coolest aspects about this plant has to do with its flower color. If you looked around and found more of them, you'll see that the colors range from almost pure white to a deep burgundy kind of pink color. Now. Insects, especially bees, are really fond of the red coloration. In fact, they, are, they tend to visit them way more often than they do the white flowers. So why do the white flowers exist? Well, they found out that the chemical compound responsible for the white coloration also incurs some antifungal benefits. In a couple of weeks, when these start really coming up and growing, you'll notice that a lot of the leaves are infected with a rust fungus. It's not immune 
to these early wet conditions that are ripe for bacteria and fungi to attack certain plant species. So by protecting the species from fungal infection, it preserves some of the white alleles in the population, allowing this gradation of color, which is really fun to look at and kind of observe in the wild. Really awesome plant, very hardy, great find, and I'm excited that it's already starting to bloom. It should be putting on a good show in the next couple of weeks. Now here's an old friend, the wild leek, Allium trichocum. I look forward to this plant every year because it tends to form these beautiful carpets, these broad oblong leaves. Now they're just starting, a little too early to see the full picture yet. And they'll sit here soaking up enough energy until around June, mid-June-ish, their leaves will wither away and the little bulb underneath the ground will throw up a beautiful little flower stalk full of bright white flowers. Now since we're in Illinois, I feel like I'd be remiss if I didn't tell you about the name Chicago. It can be traced back to this plant. The Algonquins used a rough translation of the word Chicago to talk about a place that smells like wild onions. And the Ojibwa tribe used a similar word for the place that smells like a skunk. And it all comes down to this plant. Chicago was built on the shores of Lake Michigan where these leeks would have grown in profusion. So Chicago and leeks have a strong tie and I don't think a lot of people realize. Be looking forward to this one in the weeks to come. Well everyone, the hunt has failed, but that's all right. We did see a lot of really cool stuff along the way. And that's just kind of how things go. Mother Nature's a fickle beast like that. But I enjoyed this hike and I hope you did too. And there's plenty more on the horizon, especially as spring progresses. Things are gonna get a lot more colorful. So thank you so much for watching.